Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the invitation to the committee. It's always a pleasure to be here and share work and ideas with you. And uh, it's always tough to give the first talk after the dinner, conference dinner, but on the last day of the week. And, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, so this talk um, is formally entitled The Irreducible Semantic Communicative Drive, Imagination and Culture Beyond the Hands. It could have been also called or entitled Living Fossils, Demonstratives, Bodily Actions, and Imagination Catching Fire. <laughs> um, this could be the title, but it's not the one actually I'm going to use today. Um, this is something in progress, but you would get the point towards the end of the talk of why this should be or could be the, the title of this presentation. So going back to the official title, uh, I would like to start with um, some ideas about explanatory power in science. So consider the following case, a real world utterance. So person says, so she sold me this, but she didn't sell me this or that. Now, this is a, an utterance that occurs in natural language. It's highly frequent, this sort of thing to say, you know, put this, put it over there, take that and put it under this, and so on. They're fully grammatical expressions, and they're vocalized by a clear speech, so there's no issues in, in, those, uh, in those domains. However, clearly we have a problem if we want to understand what is the meaning, or what is the communication or the communicative act, what is it about? So, um, I want to, without calling names or churches or ideologies, just in the name, in the sake of, for the sake of science, just for scientific hygiene, I just want to invoke the idea of explanatory power in the sense that if we have certain domains of linguistic production and linguistic comprehension for which we have troubles explaining, we need to probably consider our methods and theories and approaches. So I want to ask a question about are we probably over um, behaving in an over-reductionistic way sometimes? And if yes, what should we do? So that being said, I want to move to the second section of this talk and say something about reductionism. So this is a major piece in the history of evolutionary biology written by Theodosius Dolzhansky. This goes back to 1937. And um, this is the author known to be the one who said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Now, the major thing, of course, that he was able to do was to synthesize evolutionary biology and genetics. So he's the one in, in what actually, through mutations and genes, um, could, was, was able to explain natural selection, how it occurs. So this is not back in 1937. Now, um, two people already have mentioned Richard Lewontin in this conference. I'm going to also bring my own quotes for him. And he wrote, 60 years after that, he wrote a very interesting piece in 97 in which he critiqued this work. And these are some quotes of that particular piece. It says, an irony of the intellectual history of genetics and the origin of species is that Dobzhansky came into evolutionary genetics from the study of morphological diversity in nature and so was able to relate the abstractions of genetic theory to the biology of organisms. Yet, in the end, he and the field became captives of the abstractions. Another interesting passage is this one. Dobzhansky's construction of the problem of speciation as solely the problem of reproductive isolation was a piece of scientific synecdoche, substituting the process of reproductive isolation for the speciation process in its entirety. It is a testimony to the influence that genetics and the origin of species has wielded over 60 years that we continue to study the speciation process without reference to the world that organisms construct and occupy. So I want to draw the attention to this part of the citation. On the one hand is, when in any scientific discipline we develop abstractions and formalizations and um, 
sometimes coming from formal logic or mathematical language, sometimes we get trapped in those formalizations. Uh, and it's always, again, for the sake of hygiene, to check and double check how we're doing with reality. So we need the abstractions, but then we need to double check. And the other thing is, of course, this idea of replacing something for something else. Call this, this part only. So in this particular case, it's substituting the entire reproductive um, system just by very specific aspect of uh, reproduction in isolation, standing for the whole speciation process in nature. Okay? So I want to bring that idea because when we're doing science, we're forced, part of our methods is to do um, some kind of, adopt some kind of reductionism. It's part of our job. We do that all the time. Every experiment that you carry in your lab uh, will have to do it, deal with this. However, the question is, is it warranted? Every time we do a reductionistic move, are we warranting the move? And that's what I would like to address today in this case. So what is reductionism? It's this practice of studying a complex phenomenon in terms of simpler ones, taking to stand for the former without loss of explanatory power. <coughs> So, here's an example of uh, digesting that by Jacques de Maupassant, 1739, 18th century. So, at a certain level, this is a good model for understanding, let's say, how food gets into the body and spends some time inside the body and then comes out. So, in that level of generalization may be a good move. However, if you're interested in the metabolism of digestion and how it affects the nature of feathers, then probably this model is not enough. So unwarranted reductionism is this practice of studying a complex phenomenon in terms of simpler ones, taking the substance for the former, with demonstrated <coughs> loss of explanatory power. So this is now what I want to bring in, because this is something we absolutely want to avoid. No matter what church we are in, in science, doing what kinds of ideological practices, this is something that we need to avoid. So, back to Richard Lemontin, he says an evolution is particularly tricky as a subject matter because on the one hand it's a multifactorial phenomenon, and then it occurred only once. So we can't really do lab replications. We have to sort of you know, juggle with what we have. So the warranting criteria for the reductionistic move are particularly problematic and sensitive and we have to pay attention to it. The moral is then that we have to handle reductionism with care. Okay, that's the message. And of course, the question of this particular conference is, what about evolution of language? Well, we all know we have a problem. On the one hand, is a multifactorial phenomenon, is a multimodal phenomenon, as I'll show later with various examples. But the big problem we have is that the practice of language, the linguistic practice, didn't leave fossil records or DNA data. So we're not in the same position as trying to understand the evolution of bipedalism or the evolution of immune systems and so on. Three, let's move to evolution of language. So if we take this question, of course, there have been all kinds of approaches to it. So we can try to study through you know, syntactic trees and, and you know, properties like infinite <coughs> recursion. That's important. I'm not saying it's not. We can try to study the you know, organs of speech, phoneological the logical apparatus, how did it evolve. We could study you know, the genes that may regulate vocalization. But we also know that there are several dozens of languages on Earth today that do not need, let's say, a phonation apparatus. They're non phonated languages, but they still have morphology and, and quote phonology and speech accents and so on and so forth. So my claim is that there is a little domain here that hasn't been studied properly, I would say, or not enough, or at least is underrepresented. So if we zoom in a little and try to understand what is it, or look what is this nature, what kind of thing it is, we will see that in fact we have been, I would say, not neglected, but not paying attention enough to issues of meaning, bodily actions and bodily productions in real time, and how they're coupled to the environment. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only thing we should study. My point is that 
There are certain things for which we're losing explanatory power if we do not consider this. Therefore, our sin is, if we do that, uh, that we're falling into unwarranted reductionism. And we don't want to do that for the sake of scientific hygiene. So here's like three implausible scenarios. Number one, if we just look at, say, organs of speech and phonation and vocalization, we know, as I said, there are many languages that do not require that. So in that sense, we, we're not probably going to be in a scenario like, say, OK, now we got vocalization. Let's talk about something. I would call that implausible scenario number one. Or something like, OK, we have grammar. Now let's talk about something. I would call that impossible scenario number two. Now, if we look at gesture production, we could also say, well, now we can pantomime and move our hands and bodies, and we can gesture. So now let's talk about something. Impossible scenario number three. Now, what can we study then? How can we find some structure, some constraints, so in this very messy phenomenon, we can study, look for something in particular? So this is where I would like to suggest that there are certain things, even though we, we don't have DNA data, we don't have uh, paleontological you know, uh, evidence and so on, we can sort of seek or look for what I would call here the living fossils for language. So for this, I want to kind of focus on something that linguists uh, play with, um, because it's very useful, is the notion of obligatoriness. So this is now adding constraints to study something. And we see in grammar, for example, there is a obligatoriness in you know, number marking or gender marking, evidentiality marking, and so on and so forth. And I would like to ask the question, is it only in grammar that we have this phenomenon? Okay. And in particular, I want to address the issue of what happens when we deal with demonstratives. Okay. Why demonstratives? Well, let, let's look at a little bit of what they are. So, well, most of you linguists here, you know, much better than me, right? We have, for example, certain categories for uh, lexical items that deal with proximal and distal or medial in some, some languages to refer to um, in a demonstrative way to this or that, like in English. In Spanish, you could say esto, eso, and the third one, aquello, further away. Um, but what is interesting is that you have more production coming out, like demonstrative determiners, like I, lo I like those pictures, or demonstrative pronouns, I like those, simply, or demonstrative adverbs, like um, spatial for something like at that place, there, or temporal, at that time, then. Now, this is what is so interesting about demonstratives. In fact, as Diesel um, pointed out, so demonstrative is actually generally so old that their roots are not etymologically analyzable. In contrast to other closed class expressions, they cannot be traced back to content words. More important than that is also that they serve as a sort of genetic root, genetic in the sense of generating new possibilities. For example, in many languages, well, at least now, uh, I'll just point here to Romance languages, out of um, the... Um, distal, you know, demonstrative that, ile, ila, ilut, you have developments like uh, the articles el, la, los, las, or in French, le, la, le, and so on and so forth. In other languages, you have out of the distal demonstrative, the generation of the third person singular, for example, and so on and so forth. And you don't see the other way around. It's not like you have a language that would have certain kinds of pronouns, and out of the third person singular, you get the distal um, Demonstrative. So it seems to go only one way. So demonstratives are ancient. They're etymologically not analyzable in terms of uh, other, other class uh, words. And they have played a genetic role. And even today, they seem to be universal. So to me, this is, I propose, a very good candidate for a living fossil. The issue is that this comes with strings attached because in real world pro language production, demonstratives are environmentally coupled. And I will claim here, they have a high degree of the obligatoriness of what I would call here soba. We're in Japan. So soba standing for synchronized obligatory bodily action 
in the environment. Now, of course, you can also say the word that or this without having to do something with your body. There are certain cases. There are more elaborated cases I'm going to talk about later. The idea is, if we go back to the original example I started the talk with, you may need something like a soba in a real world, real environment produced in real time, which adds constraints to the nervous system that is supporting this production. So, go back to the original example. Father says, so she sold me this, but she didn't sell me this or that. If you look at speech and gesture, you would have the utterance, a certain kind of handshapes and you know, production, but we still don't know what is it about. You have some kind of hand rotating, some kind of handshake, bimanual gesture, and then movement, vertical movement of the right hand. So you need to know something else, that this was produced with a blender that the person bought, that this part is probably the bottom of the blender, and this is the top of the blender, and so on and so forth. It's only when you put speech and gesture and environment in real world, real time, that you get a sense of what is going on in this case. And this is a further analysis you can look in Chuck Goodwin's work. Now, so demonstratives then and these sobas um, are quite, they kind of go together in a certain way. And this is what I want to um, propose here in this talk today. So this is a quote now from 1934. Karl Bühler, I repeat, there's no phonetic, deitic sign that could do without the gesture or a sensory guide equivalent to the gesture of, or finally an orientation convention that takes their place. What is the moral here? Is that probably at no point in the evolution of language, demonstratives could have just stand fully alone. Okay? And this is something I would like to unpack for the rest of the talk. So, an extension of this soba, so a particular type, is pointing, and the pointing and the complexities that they entail. And I would like to analyze this a little further. Take this uh, comic from Larson. So it says, so what's this? I asked for a hammer. A hammer? This is a crescent wrench. Well, maybe it's a hammer. Damn this stone tool. All right. So if you look about it, you, see, you know you have some sort of hand production or something. How do you know what is he talking about? In this case, we want to say what is the this about? And you have two hands, and two hands are busy with tools or something, both dealing with stones. However, in this case, it's the gates telling that is this what I'm talking about, not this other stone over here. But the complexity, as we want to show a little later, um, is that. In fact, here you could say, okay, this is the singular case for proximal. How about this one, which is plural? In this case, damn these um, tone, uh, stone tools doesn't seem to be referring to any particular specific collection that has specific uh, extensionality, if you want to talk in terms of set theory. It could be these stones over here, it could be over there, and no one's looking at anyone, so they seem to be operating at different levels, even though formally you can just say, you have singular and plural, things to be looked a little bit more complicated. So for this, I want to focus a little more now on one side of the um, primate phylogeny and look at this particular um, phenomenon of uh, synchronized obligatory bodily action when you speak, in the case of humans, or these extensions to uh, pointing and associations with that. So it is interesting that when you look at um, the behavior in the wild, for uh, great apes. You may have uh, things like share attention sometimes. You may have incredibly organized and sophisticated, in the case of that orangutan, of tool use. So aiming with the body towards certain specific places in the environment for certain specific actions. But it seems that no one has ever, for the moment, there's only one paper that's reported with no pictures and no data. It's just a verbal reporting, natural, pointing in the wild. So it seems to be something that humans are excel at, and something that uh, great apes, non-human primates, in the wild at least, um, have problems. And I'm going to address the issue of what happens in, uh, in captivity. So it looks like humans, in all cultures, from a very early age, they are able to um, 
deal with this problem of reference in space and deitics pointings and bodily actions in real time and so on. So this would bring me to the next section, this synchronized obligatory bodily action and, and pointings, and want to unpack more in detail. So first thing, it looks, it seems that this is a distinctively human kind of phenomenon. Number two, emerges very early in ontogeny. Number three, does not have a fixed morphology and apparently recruits multiple articulators. So it's very complex in that sense. Now it has top-down influences, so it's culturally shaped. So it's not a genetically determined hand shape that you would get, and I will give some examples. And the most important part that I would like to address today <coughs> is that they in the, in the wild, in our own wild environments, they occur in a very abstract way, with imaginary pointings, with non-existing reference in the real world, and so on. So we want to know what is that about. Now, if we go back to almost two million years ago, the um, modern depictions of, let's say, Homo ergaster usually points or illustrates this particular uh, species or uh, as a pointing, pointing, you know, uh, animal. The question, of course, is there's no evidence whatsoever, but people tend to think that, okay, the pointing is already that old. Well, we, we don't know, so they have absolutely no evidence. But we could do today is do some comparative studies, and this is when um, you start to see, you know, for example, some people claiming, well, here you have a pointing behavior. Actually, we saw it in one of the talks in this particular conference. Well. Is this a gesture? And the answer is yes, it is a gesture. The question is, is it a pointing? And that we need to probably unpack a little more in order to understand what's happening. In fact, this very picture comes from a paper in PNAS with uh, Pollock and Deval, and they explicitly say nothing about pointing. This is a, a juvenile chimpanzee trying to reclaim food uh, that a dominant has taken away by combining the reach out a begging gesture with a, with a silent bare teeth face. So there's no real pointing in there. But some research actually tells us a little more about um, the potential or the question of production in, in chimpanzees of pointing behavior. So for the moment, we would say, well, this is not pointing. Actually, even the author says they don't claim that this is a pointing. So I would like now to um, address some work done by uh, Pavinelli. This was uh, published in various papers, but it was uh, kind of summarized in one of the bo edited books by, by one of the world leaders in pointing literature, Sotaro Kita. And this is actually quite interesting because when you study this production on the production side and this kind of begging for food, um, you, so, you, you kind of like, you know, sort of control experimentally certain aspects about that. And um, you know, as you know, chimpanzees can have a, a lot of curious behavior of exploring, so they, they're able to use the index finger for those things, even though the hand morphology <coughs> is not like humans, kind of in our resting hand, we tend to have the index kind of almost already sticking out. In the case of the chimpanzees, it's not like that, but they're able to use it when it's uh, necessary. So. Interestingly enough, if you want to check for the production, so when you have, let's say, two uh, experimenters and then one is visibly uh, not looking at the action and the other one is in four different, uh, in four different uh, conditions, uh, either blindfolded or mouthfolded or with the hands covered or the ears covered but not the eyes or let's say frontally looking or just giving the back and so on and so forth, <coughs> The behavior when the, the chimpanzee comes out and begs for the food, it would be essentially 50-50, going to one or the other with no particular preference. Uh, so we go to the person that is blindfolded or it would go to the person that is mouthfolded and so on. But it would get completely right when uh, the person is either facing or not facing. So there's something about front and back that may be playing a role because there's no errors, no mistakes. And in that case. Now, interestingly, of course, uh, for people who do research in, uh, in captivity, you will see that chimpanzees you know, are able to follow without much problem you know, get eye gaze. So if you start looking all of a sudden there, they would follow the gaze. So that is they're able to do without problem. 
So another condition is like having the experimenter looking this way or facing up. And at the beginning, it's really near 50-50. And with more and more trials, it starts to kind of increase more towards the person that is actually looking at them. But it's not something that naturally, spontaneously would come directly from uh, this different uh, way of looking at the, uh, at the scene from the, the side of the experimenter. Interestingly, um, when you have a condition like, let's say, turn around but looking and turn around and not looking, then again, you have 50-50 kind of behavior. So the idea that they're looking or not looking is not apparently clear when it comes to the production of the begging or the production of this particular gesture. Even more interesting, when you have a person facing that way but turn around with the eyes open or facing frontally with the eyes closed, um, it would actually, the person, the, the, in this case, the chimpanzee would prefer uh, the experimenter facing forward even though it has the eyes closed. So in the production side of thing, or this begging behavior at least, we seem to have some kind of uh, difference uh, and we have to keep in mind these are adult chimpanzees in, the, in captivity and so this is way far from being in the wild. Now this, of course, matches another idea of a researcher, leading researcher in, in gesture production, Adam Kendon, who said that um, gesture is in a certain way sort of visible action as utterance says, and it seems to be here there's something kind of missing about the visual part of this particular phenomenon. How about comprehension? Well, in the comprehension case, there are all kinds of manipulations, again, the same lab, uh, you know, proximity to the object, so there's food hidden. In this case, the chimp comes out, and, you know, sometimes it's pointing to the other one is far away, or quite sometimes far away from the two boxes and so on, summarizing various manipulations. Really, there's failing in the comprehension of what is the pointing standing for, or what is the referent in this case. Now, I want to move then away to the second, move, move along to the second one about ontogeny. So this goes back to my, the work of my former colleague, Liz Bates, and um, with a lot of data showing that, in fact, very interesting, is that dietic gestures are produced before word production. So you already have around eight to 10 months the production of dietic, dietic gestures, and and then this precedes by three months almost um, the word production. So it seems to be something that very early on uh, infants are able to, to put together and needless to say also in the conditions I just presented in the, in the captivity for chimps, when it's done with, with very young children, there's absolutely no problem in following or asking uh, for uh, um, begging production and so on and so forth. Now. Moving to the third one, how about morphology? So here we have a particular kind of behavior for which there's no prescribed or specific form of, um, of articulator organization, so to speak. So of course the most classic case is the one that comes from this sort of resting position. So this is, would be like the prototypical way of pointing. And as could be seen in different people, some of them cannot stun each other. Um, but, you know, the idea that we stick out our index finger and that is pointing, it's not totally wrong in the sense that it's very frequent and, um, and highly visible, but by no means is the way uh, in which people all over the world point. Okay? So this is what I would like to have. And then also we are very good at using other articulators. So if I have my hands busy and said, where's the toilet? I would just go and say, oh, it's over there, turn around, or I'd use the other parts of my body to deal with that. And in real time, meeting all the, all the constraints of, of real time. So you can see all kinds of hand shapes in, in, you know, you could see palms up, you could see counterlateral with index pointing over the shoulder, ipsilateral with thumb, so completely different muscular and hand organization. Uh, or let's say in this uh, work, which is also in Sotaro Kita's edited book by, this is now uh, Wilkins, describing, for example, at the Arrente in Australia, different kinds of hand shapes depending on what kinds of things we are pointing or talking about. If it's a surface extended, 
you have point, you know, hand shape that would tend to kind of go palm down, sticking the finger out like that. Or it could be middle finger pointing. Uh, if you're giving directions, it would be palm towards the interior with different hand shapes. Not at all an easy thing, and with a lot, a lot of variation. Now, of course, um, we can also point with tools, which is something I've been trying to do here, but this doesn't work on this screen. So I can point there, but I cannot point here. Um, and I did some ethnography in a very exotic country yesterday near the Golden, you know, palace. This is I was in the bus number one for those who were with me. And there we have our guide using opportunistically, you know, pointing with a different hand shape now, uh, using a tool, uh, or in this case for my Mara people using a you know music instrument and so on and so forth. What is interesting about this particular tool is that it kind of over-specifies sometimes. It's very interesting. I have one of my grad students studying the use of laser point because if I want to point to this clock and I point there, I'm being too precise. So if I say, see that clock there? This hand point is good enough. But if I go like that and say, see this? You won't know whether I'm pointing to the 3 or the 11 or the 50. So what people do? They go like this. So I say, OK, I don't want to be that specific. So I, you know, move back a little bit, and, and you can see when you when you see pops, not here because it's here the things don't work. You can do the research, and people go like that, and you know, over here, and this relates to that, and so on. So despecifying, because naturally the cone of reference would work, but this here is over specifying sometimes. Okay, more interesting is bodily articulators that are recruited, head point. And in many areas, totally unrelated areas in the world, lip pointing in Nigeria, in Malaysia, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia and other places, in the Philippines, uh, in Latin America, and so on. So these are completely different articulators that are recruited with presumably with completely different you know, areas of the brain dealing with this particular motor actions. So here's like descriptions of you know, full-blown lip point, building head, gaze, eyebrows, different kinds of lip protrusion. Sometimes it's the upper lip, the lower lip. Sometimes you have uh, lips parted, sometimes you don't. So all those things are marking different kinds of things. Again, in cultures when sometimes participants will have hands freely available, so to speak, but that's the preferred mode. More recently, with my student, uh, former student now, he graduated, uh, Kenzie Cooper writer, we were doing a difference we, an we analyzed, we were studying for other reasons, and Papua New Guinea, um, know a, a, uh, we were looking at construals of time, and uh, all of a sudden we found this particular kind of case, which is called the, no we calling nose pointing, which is like a scrunching of the face, in which I cannot do that because I don't have practice, and so the nose kind of sticks out by moving the specific muscles. And, and they can just point and pick you know, certain kinds of things, even though sometimes the hands are completely free. So we have very different muscles involved in, let's say, lip pointing. You have the orbicularis oris and the mentalis that would allow you to you know, move your lips like that. In the case of the nose pointing, you have the procerus, which is that muscle that allows you to put this face and then the uh, levator labi superioris, which is kind of the one that we're able to shrink the nose up, and then it will stick out. So very, very different articulators putting in place in real time again. So here's one example, so you can see the complexity. This is again high in the mountains in Papua New Guinea with uh, no electricity, no roads, uh, hard to get there. And so just so you get a sense here. So there you have about, it's very subtle, of course, I don't know whether you're able to see it, but you can see in a very, uh, you know, very s subtle way over here, um, the scrunching of the nose to point to something that is in there, that's the, the scrunch note, and then you have a head point for a, lo a general location, and then you're going to have uh, another head point, and now you have an eye gaze and pointing with the left hand. So all these things in real time being manipulated in very complicated ways. Um, you have some extensions sometimes for grammatical roles and, and semantic roles. 
Um, I may actually go relatively quick on this, but you have some kind of production that would have this crunch phase that is recruited for other purposes, referring to small things. And it's known that in many languages, the use of diminutives, for example, is recruited for preciseness. So in Spanish, you could say now or little now, ahora, ahorita. And if you really want, like this, right, this, means you could say ahoritita in some dialects of Spanish, like really small, small, small now, and so on. So it looks like in this particular case, if we based on the uh, Jurafsky's analysis of the semantic network for um, small and child is related to all kinds of, this is studying after 60 different languages, uh, and one of them is child's more exactness. So we believe now, this is what we're analyzing, is that sometimes when they have available in this particular culture the you know, the pointing behavior, they may want to either uh, modify the pointing with a precision. And in this case, you would have, it's almost as if we were pointing like this with our hand. Now we're combining articulators with semantic roles to specify not just the reference, but also the exactness of what you're pointing. And by that, you use the nose pointing. Culturally shaped, as we said, this is a fourth characteristic. And we already mentioned variations of that, so I'm not going to go too much into the details. Um, but what is interesting is that with certain kinds of handshake, in, for example, the arrente, you can only use it for certain kinds of roles. For example, if you want to point to something that moves, so you can't just say that door over there with this handshake. You would have to only point for a dog that is going that way. Okay? But certain kinds of uh, constraints, you cannot hold that. You can't say, oh, the toilet is there, and then you hold it for it. 1,200 milliseconds. In this case, you could say, the dog's going there. No hole, for example. So you have hand shapes with specific kinds of coordination and constraints of how the hand shape is supposed to be used and under what, what constraints. I'll come back to the cultural variation in a second. Now, the most important thing I would like to mention now, other than all the issues about um, how often they occur and, and, and the onto ontogenetic features and so on, is that in fact when we point and we produce these sort of demonstrative slash um, soba kind of behavior, they occur in the most abstract cases. We say, oh, the elevator is over there, so we're going through walls. Uh, I park over here, the train station is over there. So we have to somehow know what are we talking about, how far are you talking about. Uh, we point to things that are not, don't exist in reality, like north, for example. Um, many other ones like self-pointing, and we'll analyze very briefly, and then in particular other cases like metaphorical cases, metonymical cases, part, you know, part whole relationships uh, that need to be picked and understood, that require a lot of complexity from a cognitive point of view, fictive motion, anaphora, and so on. I don't have time to go into all the details, but I mentioned only a few. Here's self-pointing. So we have, for example, again, this is from the, the work of my student, former student, you could sometimes, it's co-produced with instances like I, or sometimes with my, very different. Or sometimes in this case with the term himself. So he himself wanted to do this or this or that, and at that moment there's a co-production with self-pointing. Why would that be? Doing some random uh, re, you know, ethnographic work with some random people in Japan uh, who were paid in weak American dollars to produce this gesture. Um, you can see probably you know, that, for example, the reference for self in Japan is not the chest, tend to be much higher, sometimes nose or mouth, for example. So again, we have a lot of variation. The point is here is that when you have self points, the reference could be we, we Chileans love red wine. And I point here, all of a sudden I have 15 million people standing for this, liking red wine. Uh, or our society basketball players, my parents, and on and on and on. Very, very complicated. Now here is the, uh, I know Lynn Talmy was a speaker in one, of the, in one of the previous conferences. We have cases, for example, of the fence stops after the forest. The equator passes through many countries. So these are construals where static entities are conceived as being dynamic. What about here? Well, this, again, going to Rarente, we would have specific kinds of pointings that only can exist with mo motion events, and they can be fictive motion, like in this case, it's co-produced with 
the dreaming travels through to Ilewer. Okay, how about conceptual metaphors? Abstract again. Here's an example. Okay, so what do we have of interest here? Well, all I want to show is, let's say, what the, the incredibly tight co-production. So we're going to move here, the cursor said, when he said, wouldn't that be today? At that moment, he said, wouldn't that, the hand shape is already profiling, wouldn't that, that's the B, wouldn't that be today? At that moment, you have the stroke pointing down, completely abstract referent, and then it says, stays there for a few hundred milliseconds, and I said, tomorrow, all of a sudden pointing something in front. So the question is, what are those references standing for? Why is it recruited in real time in this particular way? And this idea, of course, in conceptual metaphor theory, at some point was postulated to be a universal, that we conceive the future as being in front, the past behind. But when I did work with the Aymara of the Andes, we found that, in fact, in this particular culture, the opposite is the case. So when people start pointing to the front, when you have past events and past terms and behind, with different kinds of high morphology behind them when they talk about the future. I can give all the statistics and all the numbers if you're interested in. But most recently, with the Yubna of Papua New Guinea, we discovered that even the variation could be even wilder outside of egocentric space sagittal egocentric, we uh, found that in fact in this particular culture, deitic time, future, past, and present, is actually anchored and grounded on topographic properties, decline of uh, declivity of the terrain, where past is conceived as downhill and future is conceived as uphill. And this is not just anecdotal data, we collected tons of pointing behaviors, we did all this kind of vectorial analysis and spherical statistics to summarize and predict the whole thing on the topography of the valley to actually see that when they're pointing, irrespective of the position, facing up, uphill or downhill or whatever, the pointing goes downhill when it's the past, it goes uphill when it's, when it's the future. So again, here we have very abstract production uh, that you could see um, recruiting these pointings and conveying very sophisticated ideas. Here's another case. Today, tomorrow, tomorrow, after tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. So if we go here, this is only a head point, and you can see uh, that's today. Tomorrow is gonna, the head is gonna go a little higher. Then the day after tomorrow is gonna look towards the top of the hill over there with the head, even though the hands are completely available. So. To, find, to complete the, the discussion here, what do we have? What I propose here is that the study of language evolution, as I understand it, has been sort of dominated or over-represented by what I would call here unwarranted reductionism. In a certain way, I find that unnecessary limiting, and we need to avoid it. We need to explain the whole domain of linguistic production, not certain types. So in this case, I was proposing that we have the possibility of studying some kind of living fossil, some niches of contemporary linguistic practices that can inform questions of language evolution. In this particular case, I was trying to focus on the properties of demonstratives as being very old and ancient and having all these incredibly rich um, capacities for being extended to more sophisticated forms. The practice then of language here is inherently multi-model. Now, where I want to conclude here is a meaningful communicative drive is irreducible. We cannot put it aside. And this on three different levels. At the micro time happening in milliseconds, real time production. At the ontogenetic time, child development. And phylogenetic time in you know, analyzing selective pressures that brought certain types of species to have this particular behavior, not others. So 
What is probably going on? We have gesture, we have vocalizing, maybe co-evolving together with neural power. Not just those two, I would claim co-evolving with cognitive capacities for imagination, abstraction, and symbolization. So if I point to that door, even though it's spatial dices, I have to pick some place of that door to say, this is what I mean for the entire door. Okay? And if I say here, this here could be exactly this place, not where you are. It could be here in Kyoto. It could be here in Northern Hemisphere, here on Earth, and so on and so forth. We have to have a very flexible and fast system that will be able to determine that. So we don't want to be in the position of, was it gesture first? Was it vocalization first? What was it first? I think we have to look for something different. So what conditions made that possible? Well, the likely scenario that I, I want to propose here is that presumably language evolved out of activities in small groups, short distance communication, not yelling at you know, a mile away, fast, real time, one to few uh, interactions, one to one, largely facing mutual interlocutors in probably circles, multitasking, semantically loaded, dietic, bodily, and facial actions co-produced with subtle vocalizations. So what, what does that mean? What would be those conditions? Well, here's one, is that we can see that, uh, this is from my friend Pascal Gagnon, if you think, for example, the, there's a long weaning period supported by increased body mass that, uh, in the case of the humans, is um, sort of on the right top side of the, of this, of the figure. And then, as uh, Kazuo Kanoya has pointed out, when you look at, for example, the crying of babies, you may have a sort of a progressive um, discrimination and coordination of action, sort of semantic um, actions with real time, again, um, that this bodily interaction with mother would allow. So we have substantial postnatal brain development in socially meaningful context and room for longer and richer mother-infant interaction. But there's more. There's a dramatic dietary change which still needed to support increase in body mass. So what do we know? We know, for example, 1.6 million. So we already have evidence that there's some uh, you know, sites with ancient um, uh, hearth and fire. But it's, even now, we have pretty good evidence that around um, 800,000 years controlled fire. So this is, if you think about it, is almost like four times the beginning of our species 200,000 years ago. More importantly, it's about really controlled, uncontroversial um, findings, is that 400,000 years, fire was controlled fully. Okay? And this allowed for something new, which is cooking. And cooking allowed for the production, the, the consumption of new foods that were not available, that we could not digest otherwise. And that occurred about 100,000 years ago. So now we're talking about humans. It takes about 50,000 more years only to get things like symbolic painting. So what happened here? You have controlled fire way before being humans, meaning that fire is part of who we are. And this actually changed our genome. So if you look at the proportions of small intestines versus colon in uh, other non-human primates, orangutans and gorillas and chimpanzees, the colon is way bigger than the small intestine. It's only in humans that the proportions change dramatically. And that meant that at some point, this activities with some kind of activity, and researchers have suggested this fire, actually allowed change in uh, this particular species because of the control fire and cooking. You have a completely different dietary um, activity which de facto changed now the genome of this species. And this, I want to make a distinction from this kind of cultural activity from the ones I was referring earlier. This is now not just a cultural transmission. Now, this is a cultural activity that is selecting for a new, um, new uh, genome, so to speak, that has this small intestine. So absorbing nutrients from foods that you were not able to do and for which you need to cook. So the new life with daily fire, well, it meant a new type of digestion with a much more efficient 
energy intake, access to more foods they couldn't do otherwise, and the expansions to new territories, so you cannot just depend on the little berries that you have nearby. You can go else, and you can defend yourself from other you know, species. You can sleep on the ground when your body, which is what happens with humans, is not able to climb anymore with the same efficiency. You need to be on the ground, but being on the ground is dangerous. Fire would solve that problem. And a new problem. Now we need to eat cooked food. So there's a lot of research showing that if we eat raw food, only raw food for a little while, we're in trouble. So we need to be eating cooked food. So for our purposes in language, all these conditions, the scenario was describing, small groups, short distance communications, fast real time processing, etc. In fact, by the time we have fire, then uh, provides a completely new different scenario. We have a 50% longer day for social interactions with rich complexities, with let's say visible social in, in exchange, with the properties that I was describing before, facing uh, mutual interlocutors, in circle, multitasking, cooking, and so on and so forth. And I would claim these living fossils then, demonstratives and sovas were most likely already there when these things happened. And with that, I say that that's that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk from the University of University of Warsaw. Uh, I wanted to ask, because you showed the coupling between gestures and linguistic production, because sometimes you can have gestures without that. So what does it look like in uh, on thought journey development of, um, let's say, uh, some pathological cases where you have humans who are, let's say, deformed so that they practically cannot produce gestures or to a large extent that's mm -hmm. largely impaired? And um, does that, how does that impact <coughs> linguistic production? Well, um, that, that's an interesting question. I don't think it addresses the issue of how things emerge. Um, here, with this talk, what I was trying to address is then saying, let's look at certain things that may have played an important role. So, um, I mean, today we have all kinds of, uh, because of the technology we develop, people who cannot, uh, you know, tolerate certain kinds of foods, people who cannot walk, people, you know, and so on and so forth, handicap of all sorts. And we could, so, we could ask the general question, what happens with these people? That's a very interesting question. I don't think it informs really the question of what would have happened in the origins uh, in the case I was describing, because, because probably those, those people who cannot digest this kind of food or cannot walk for a long time or cannot do this and that would not survive to the impact of being. So in that sense, there's a lot of research of gesture production with you know, aphasia and, and pathological cases, which are very interesting and intriguing. Um, I would say for the type of uh, presentation I was doing here is not as relevant in the sense that they may not have played a role because they were probably <coughs> outliers. So we look at statistically how many of those people were in this society. But the research is there and, uh, and it's very interesting what happens in those cases when you have different kinds of pathological cases. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask really quick about uh, the eight gesture work that you had quoted. I was wondering if you could also talk a little bit about some of the newer stuff coming out, um, David Levin, Brazil Hopkins, looking at gestures and activity, or the more recent papers on the object choice task suggesting that chimpanzees can in fact pass out and so that either when the object is further away or when they have some support to the environment. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. Well, I mean, the, the, the reason why I was involved in this literature wasn't so much to say um, they cannot do it. Um, the reason why I invoked this particular research was to say that this is not this is not the right the, the conditions in which you know chimpanzees evolve and they exist in the wild. They've been encultured and they are in the human setting, being fed and vaccinated and you know, treated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it, from that perspective, yes, we could we could talk about the details of, of that kind of research. Uh, it informs certain kinds of things. I don't think it informs the kind of origin that I was trying to describe today in the sense that when we can have certain species doing something, let's say I've seen dogs skateboarding, you know, well, we can teach 
dogs to say skateboard. Now the question is, what does it tell us about locomotion in dogs and things like that? I think for the question here of looking for living fossils, so looking for something that may have been there, the origin, uh, the purpose of cycling this particular work was to say, well, even in those adult infancies in, in captivity today, it seems that it's not directly something natural, spontaneous, that you could sort of follow uh, you know, a point or the pig, uh, sorry, uh, pinpoint to a particular reference and so on. But we could, I mean, we could talk about the, the specificities of, of the work and what kind of form for sure. Thank you. Hi, um, I enjoy the talk, and uh, especially uh, I, I agree with the idea that uh, kind of go evolution of uh, uh, gesture and language and other kind of communication tools. And um, I, I'd like to uh, comment on the, the last part of your talk and uh, a part of some cooking. And uh, so I think that the, main, the significance or uh, importance of the cooking is uh, the, not only the, the items you uh, in, uh, point, uh, mentioned, but also the point is that the cooking makes the food very soft and which makes the, uh, the, the uh, muscle uh, could be changed. And uh, by that uh, way, the, it result in the, kind of the change of the shape and uh, especially the jaw areas and mouth areas. That also could be a kind of some motive force to, uh, to accelerate the, the scale of the language. Right, so absolutely, the, the research shows that what happens in the small intestine and the, the kind of absorption, how, you know, for example, this idea when, I don't know, you guys saw uh, Rocky, the movie, you know, the boxer guy eating his raw eggs in the morning, and so well, research shows that it's not the best way for really getting proteins out of eggs. It's much better if you cook them. So uh, we, we're we now kind of stuck in this line of evolution, which we have to pursue, and of course, all that follow with a change of morphology small molars, etc., etc. The point for the talk uh, was to say that it's been 400,000 years at the very least that we are almost essentially daily with fire. And that means sitting in circles, extending the moment in which we interact like consistently, and that uh, changed the genome and probably opened up the possibilities for uh, interactions and, and It is well known in the Novska University of Lodz, Poland. Uh, I appreciate your talk a lot, especially that it's one of the few at this conference that introduces this complete cognitive linguistics uh, um, apparatus and uh, uh, paradigm. Um, my question refers to other living fossils that you can think of. Uh, and, uh, I think one of the next candidates would be uh, emotions and uh, emotional interjections. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the topic we discussed at uh, the emotions workshop here. Um, I uh, um, saw that some of the emotional inter interjections are almost universal. Uh, and of course, the basic emotions are very frequently egoistic. But uh, the, the further you go uh, uh, with the development of social interaction, the social emotions evolve, like you know, anger that is directed at somebody. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, those social interjections uh, must have been produced almost spontaneously, and then they uh, uh, became more and more uh, conventionalized. So they would be probably one of the next candidates of uh, living well, I think without, I mean, if what, what are we talking about in all this campfire situation is probably a lot about gossiping and who's sleeping with whom and, uh, and all that stuff, the emotion, I think it's part of the content for sure. Uh, here I was trying to pinpoint certain kinds of specific uh, me cognitive mechanisms that would allow for imagination like metaphors and metonymies, part whole relationships, and using the pointings and the, the demonstrations.